Well, uh, welcome everyone to the 98th virtual shadowing session. Uh, tonight, we're gonna be covering a PA spotlight in plastic surgery. And our special guest tonight is Doris Hanson, who is herself a physician assistant. Um, let's see. This is our virtual shadowing working group. As always, we have Taylor, Alana, Aditya, Rohit, myself, Cheyenne, Christina, Kiana, Ali, and Ashia. Uh, and then, of course, we have our physician faculty members here, Dr. Fowler, Dr. Salazar, Dr. Wynn, and Dr. Reno. And next slide here. So we do have a question and answer session at the very mm -hmm. end of the session. Um, so please type your questions in the Zoom or YouTube live chat as we go along. And we're going to be doing our best to get to those questions as well. Uh, and Dr. Fowler had an announcement here. Well, welcome everybody. It's so good to have you back. You know, we're approaching two years now and 98 lectures can, uh, talks. I mean, can you believe it's gone that far? We've had over 520,000 people who watched our videos online and uh, over a quarter million have printed their attendance certificates for, <clears throat> for preparation for turning these certificates in on their application. So we encourage you to watch the talk and take the exam, print your certificate. Uh, I know that we pay close attention to these here at UT Southwestern on our admissions committee and um, that you would uh, find those helpful in your application process. I want to once again remind you that this program is absolutely free. However, when you're taking the exam, if you feel so moved to click on the GoFundMe and send us a dollar or two, we will put that in the fund. This program takes about, about $10,000 a year to run and we have some funding. But uh, still, uh, any help would be appreciated. Uh, we have perhaps a little bit of a, of a snafu on our presentation next week. I will clear that up in the next day or so. However, um, what I would like to announce is that if we do have a snafu, why don't we do another virtual interviews online? And if you're willing to be a part of the interviews online, say three of you, if you want to volunteer, uh, we'll send out a note and that you can volunteer and we will give uh, a cash award to those that do volunteer. <laughs> look at all those say, I volunteer, look at this, uh, Miguel and Ricardo say they want to volunteer. Uh, so anyway, um, so good to have you tonight. We have an exciting speaker tonight that you're going to find just riveting and uh, look forward to it. Say, so Cheyenne, would you uh, introduce our marvelous speaker for this evening? Absolutely. So let me pull up the slides that we have for her here. All right. And so tonight, of course, like I said, we are joined by Doris Hansen, who is a physician assistant that works in plastic surgery. And so we're very excited to have her here tonight. And without further ado, I will hand it to her. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Cheyenne. And um, thank you, Dr. Fowler. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and welcome everyone joining in. Um, yes, my name is Doris and I am in plastics, um, a PA in, located in Toronto. And I'll get more about what I do and where I'm located and throughout my slides. Um, and my handle's on the left-hand side of the screen. <laughs> um, so you can follow me there too. Um, and yes, April showers bring me flowers. Um, although it's raining here in Toronto, uh, we, we have been looking forward to the Mayflowers indeed. So uh, next slide. Okay, um, these are a little bit of the topics I'm gonna be discussing today um, about me, my current jobs, uh, about the journey, um, all the jobs that I've had as a PA. I'm actually coming up on my 10 year anniversary and um, so <laughs> I didn't take, um, I, I took an arduous road. <laughs> and, um, and now I used to be a USPA and now I'm a Canadian PA. So I'm gonna talk about the differences in the healthcare system of at least what I have noticed so far. Um, and uh, there's like a little pop-up on my screen so I can't see the rest of my slide. <laughs> um, and I talk about advancements in plastics and then I actually have a case study. So next slide. Um, is there a way to get up the, oh, can I mute these pop-ups here or no? Uh, is that the, uh, are you referring? <laughs> no, it's fine. It's, it's not really getting in the way right now, but yeah. Okay, oh. that's fine, that's fine. Um, there we go. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think you passed one. So. There we go, sorry about that. <laughs> so a little bit about me. I'm a board certified US trained PA. 
Um, I'm currently living and working in Toronto, Canada, and um, I am working in a plastic surgical office. It's a private clinic, but I work with about five plastic surgeons. Um, it's called the Toronto Cosmetic Institute of Surgery. Um, they've also called themselves Six Surgery because Toronto's called the Six, um, coined by Drake, but also it's like composed of like six cities. Um, and yeah, I first assist in the operating room. I also do follow-ups. Um, and we do purely cosmetic surgeries and some uh, cosmetic revisions as well. Um, so a lot of it is um, we do BBLs, Brazilian butt lifts, which are major fat transfers, um, liposuction um, to all areas of the body. We do facelifts, we do breast augmentation, uh, mass apexies, breast reductions, breast lifts, um, tummy tucks. Um, we do abdominal uh, rectus diastasis repair during our tummy tucks, um, brachioplasties for major weight loss patients, and we do some of the gender um, affirmation surgeries as well. Um, that's just like covering like our top surgeries that we, we do, but we do other little small procedures as well. Um, so yeah, I'll go into a case at the end of the, at the end of this lecture. Um, and I recently picked up a part-time position also in Canada. Um, it's at a testing center um, and it's does, I do the pre-screening to, for healthy volunteers for phase one trials. Um, we also do bioequivalent studies. And um, for those of you who are, you know, not familiar with how drugs get approved um, by the, by the FDA and get on the market, um, the phase one clinical trials is actually the first human trials. So they first tested out in um, animals and in the lab at first, and then this is actually testing in, in humans. So phase one is to see if the, how well the drug works, um, sorry, how safe the drug is. Um, and so they start with micro dosing the drug in humans um, compared to like placebo, and we closely monitor them. And then it goes into, um, single ascending dose and then multiple ascending doses. So they slightly increase the dose as they go along um, to see how the safety again uh, and the side effects in the patient and healthy volunteer. Um, and then it goes on to phase two trials, um, which is how well it works. So they use it in patients that actually have the disease and they see how well it works compared to a placebo. And then phase three, they compare it to the standard treatment on the market already. Um, so it can be a completely different drug. And then phase four of um, introduction of medications is when the doctors are, um, have their own patients and they want to introduce the drug too. So they can even dose it themselves to find like a safe, a safe dose as well. Um, so yeah, it's pretty interesting to see, you know, to be a part of the phase one trials um, and even the bioequivalent studies, which are, uh, which are after a brand a brand name drug has been on the market for 10 years, it loses its patent. And then um, a generic drug can come on the market. So they still have to test those drugs to make sure it's safe and it's, and it's effective, um, the same, similar to the brand name. Um, and it's just interesting to see how much money is spent to, to get FDA approved. Um, I think a drug on the market is like, they spend at least $1.2 billion on average for a brand name drug. So, um, so it's, it's a pretty big, uh, it's pretty serious and it's pretty big to get into um, for drug companies. Um, we also, they also do like HAL studies, which are human addiction liability studies. And this is to determine whether or not the drug that's coming to the market has um, an addictive property. And, and this is how we determine the schedule of drugs. So like from schedule one through schedule five. Um, and if you're a prescriber, like you should, you're, you're gonna be aware of these if, um, upon graduating and stuff like that. So um, if you're DEA approved. Next slide. Okay, the journey, dude. <laughs> um, everybody talks about their journey and, um, you know, like having fun along the way. Um, the why I became a PA, I actually made a decision um, when I was in high school. 
Um, I was introduced to, well, I'll talk about that in the next slide, but um, how I got started, where I went to PE, where I went to school, my part-time job through school, um, how I felt as a new grad, and then how it's going right now. Um, okay, next slide. <laughs> Okay, so um, I graduated from high school in 2007. Um, I was introduced, well, I knew I wanted to do medicine from way before then. Like, um, I think my parents definitely had an involvement in that. Uh, but I also um, had a natural, like, helping side to me and I wanted to take care of people. Um, so that's how I like wanted to do medicine. And also like grades, you know, I did well in math and sciences, so you know, kind of like that generic reason of why you get into medicine. I think uh, a lot of people have a similar story. Um, I had really bad acne in my early teen years and throughout my teenage years and even into my 20s. Um, so I went to a dermatologist <laughs> and uh, I saw the dermatologist a few times and then I was switched over to the PA. And I didn't even know what a PA was at the time, but um, she treated me and she took over my care and she was excellent. She was just very caring, very thorough, um, and actually helped me get rid of my acne. So I have really clear skin right now. Um, it took many years <laughs> to get there, but uh, she's the one that introduced me to be a PA. And then I looked into it and um, I found a really great program um, where, from like in the area. Um, I'm actually from New York City originally. Uh, I lived in Staten Island most of my life and I went to school there. So I'm a Staten Island girl, um, like Pete Davidson is. So, <laughs> so um, how I got started, I applied for schools. Um, so I was like 17, you know, taking my SATs um, all throughout high school. I had great, great, great marks. Um, I did volunteer work in hospitals and nursing homes. Um, you know, I did what everyone said to do and um, I applied for a bunch of PA schools and my college advisor, uh, my college um, high school counselor um, told me I should take my ACTs. I don't even know if that's a real thing anymore. Do people still take ACTs? Yeah. She said that I wouldn't, she said based on my SAT scores, I wouldn't be able to get into any PA school. <laughs> and um, so I took my ACTs and I mean, I did about the same, but mo I think most schools still look at the SATs. I don't know if that, that has changed in the past uh, 15 years, <laughs> but, um, and I applied in like the tri-state area um, just cause um, my parents again, like they didn't want me to dorm. They were like, oh, you, you live in New York city. You can go to the best schools around here. So it saved me a lot of money in the long run too. Um, and I went, I attended Wagner College, um, which is a private school in Staten Island. And I actually made the waiting list. I went to the interviews and I made the waiting list. And from there, from the waiting list, I phoned the school. I spoke to like the program director. I was like, is there anything that I can do to like get into this program? You know, I'm a Staten Islander. I want to be close. I want to do my rotations around here. And she was like, okay, why don't you shadow this ERPA? So I went in and I shadowed this ERPA and she, you know, said that it just showed that I was like adamant about getting in and showed that I cared. So um, I actually got into the program and that was like really awesome. <laughs> well, Doris, don't feel like a lone ranger. I, uh, it, 50 years, a half century ago, I was applying to medical school and I was doing early admission from the university of Georgia to the medical college of Georgia. And, uh, uh, I was waitlisted. Uh, they were accepting two for early admission. There, there were three applicants. I was ranked number three and number one didn't take it. So I slid right in and suddenly I was in medical school. <laughs> yeah, I mean, making the waiting list, even though, you know, I went to the interview, that was like a huge accomplishment. But even making the waiting list, I felt like very devastated. Like I remember that. Feeling. I think I was like depressed for like a good month. <laughs> Um, which a lot of people feel, I know it's like a huge rejection. Um, well, you know, I was in a very formative phase of my life at the time. I just changed from pre-law. I was bored to death <laughs> to, uh, to pre-med and doing all the sciences and just ripping it through the sciences. Yeah. And, um, but it was still quite an impressionable formative time in my life. And I, I remember some dark feelings about not knowing my next direction when I was whitelisted, you know? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I was, I was a senior in high school, you know, like people are talking about prom and I'm like, where am I going to go to school? <laughs> so, um, but I made it in and I went to Wagner College again, which is a private school in Staten Island. And um, I put down pros and, and cons of private school. Um, I just felt that um, upon graduating, like nobody really looked at for PA school. I mean, no one really looked at what PA school I went to. Um, even though like in the tri-state area, if it's a reputable school, which it, which it still is, um, I think they care a little bit more, but if you're spending a lot of money on a school versus like a community college, then I would ch probably choose community college if it's the same level of education. Um, what I liked about my school is that um, because it was a private school and because it was so small, um, they didn't accept, they accepted about 30 students on, on admission and 24 of those 30 graduated on graduation day five years later. Whereas a lot of other schools I found admitted you know, you got into the PA program and they admit like five, like a, like a hundred students. And then they like year after year, they kind of like weed you out of that. And I, um, I mean, of course I had to maintain a certain GPA to get me through, through PA school, but I didn't really like how they would just, you know, accept a hundred students thinking you're going to get in and then like, kind of like really don't want you to be there. Um, and um, so it's two years undergrad. I did two years undergrad throughout the program. And then, um, and then it's three years of PA school with your master's. So it was a two and three, I think they call it. And um, the three years are like no summer vacations, no winter vacations. It's just like back to back of PA school. Um, and again, you have to maintain, maintain a certain GPA. And that did was- you do a man, Did you do a master's thesis or- Yes. Yeah. I had to do a master's thesis. Mm -hmm. what, what did you write about? Do you recall? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was, some, people, some people block it out. You know? <laughs> no, actually. Um, yeah. My master's thesis was on um, the testing and treatment of hyperkalemia um, in a hemolyzed specimen in the ED and whether or not you had to retest based off of G GFR. And we actually went to um, it was me and uh, three other of my classmates and we got to present it at um, the American College of Emergency Physicians in Colorado in 2012. Cool, so. cool, that's my college. Uh, and that's a great little study. You know, we deal with uh, hemolyzed specimens all the time and we don't actually look at the GFR vis-a-vis -vis the hemolyzed specimens. That's just not something we do. So that's very interesting. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm surprised I remember that. But yeah, that was a great moment to do the master's thesis. I think um, I know there are programs that have only bachelors, but it's nice to learn about research and to do your own research because um, it comes in handy when you're, you know, again, prescribing medications and efficacies and, and, and you know, analyzing data. Um, so I think if you're choosing between a master's or a bachelor's, it made a difference in one year. So I guess... Um, Everyone can make their choice. Um, yeah, and I had a part-time job throughout school. Um, my mother is a hairdresser and she had opened her own hair salon. Um, so I started working as a, a shampoo girl from, <laughs> from an early age throughout high school. And I just kept that job throughout PA school. Um, and it came in handy during the pandemic because I started doing hair <laughs> again. <laughs> um, I still help her out sometimes if she needs it. So um, it's fine. Okay, next slide. Okay, yeah, so how I felt about graduating with PA program with my master's and like how my PA program made us feel upon graduating. We felt like we were the elite on campus. Uh, I felt very confident, I felt very helpful. I felt like I can go out there and make a difference in the world. And I feel like somewhere along the way, um, and it may be from the pandemic as well, but, um, there's definitely been a higher rate of burnout, but I feel like, you know, I worked so hard and then I feel like I constantly have to prove myself um, as a PA um, in the workforce. Um, and it's possible that it's because I'm in Canada too. So they don't really, they don't have as many PAs. Um, but I don't know, I just found that I always have to figure, like prove myself to people or, or even to patients to, to know that, I, I mean, I know that I'm competent and everything like that, 
but I don't, I don't know if I really, I think my expectations of what I would be after PA school and then like was a little bit skewed from, from my PA program. I think they like yeah. built, built us up, you know, like you're going to get out there and you're going to change the world. And it's like, you're going to get out there and you're going to just see patients left and right. But Doris, I'm sure in your practice, you have many, many patients, at least dozens, if not many more, who really expect to see you now, right? I mean, you're, you're their person, I would think. Um, well, in my current position, like I, I mean, I'm mostly in the operating room, so I don't really get to work with patients. I, I see them in follow-ups and things like that, but I don't really get to work with them um, one-to-one. Uh, but yeah, no, like, I mean, yes, there is, there, there's definitely, I'm definitely helping people like even throughout my other careers and stuff like that. But I, I think, I think, um, I don't know. I think working in the real world compared to how PA school looked when I was graduating was, was a little bit different. And I will say at, Par at Parkland hospital, um, in our ER and in our urgent care center, I work both. Uh, we work right alongside PAs and NPs, and they practice very independently. We discuss the cases, we go over them, I sign their charts, but um, we, we, I mean, it's side by side, uh, Doris. Yeah, and I think, I think a lot of these places work like that. I think it just depends on where you end up working. So I think it's also building trust as well with your, um, your supervising physician. Um, and yeah, I just like, you, you know, and another thing is that, um, being a healthcare worker nowadays is just, it seems like it's maybe the grass is always greener on the other side, but it, it does like the hard work ethic of like working hard, you know, you know, picking up those shifts and, and, and taking like being that great resident and things like that. I, I sometimes feel that like, sometimes it goes unappreciated or um, other fields of non-medical fields, maybe, not that they don't work as hard, but like, I don't know, I think they get rewarded more um, or more have more perks in working, like benefits. Um, I'll go more into that, like in my, in my topic, but. Um, yeah, I, uh, I spent half my career in the private sector of emergency medicine in my home state of Georgia. And then I sold the practice, retired, quote unquote, and then got invited to come to UT Southwestern 21 years ago. And I, I, it's very the environments are pretty different, you know, but I really like the academic thing because it's salaried. I have definite benefits and um, I feel much more than I'm paid to think as opposed to produce, you know, uh, maybe I'm deluding myself, but, but what do you mean when the work hard ethic is so two generations <laughs> ago? What, what do you mean? I mean that like this generation, you know, I'm like millennial generation, but this generation of, um, of working hard I don't think I don't think it's like that anymore I think the generation is like you know trying to make money as fast as possible or like the the fastest route and um I, I don't you think mean more like, less less of a career more, and more of a more of a job is that what you mean less of a career more of a job and then also yeah and more of a life more of life and, and life balance and not so much work life balance, but more like just like life itself and like traveling and, and hobbies and things like that. And then job is just like, okay, that makes the money. And then versus like, like my work ethic of like, you know, sticking to it, volunteering, putting all those extra hours in, it just doesn't feel like, like that seems like what's the current trend right now. So we're seeing a, uh, huge uh, retirement of nurses uh, here, here in the States, as many as 20% or more of nurses are leaving to the point where hospitals are having to look for alternatives for staffing like EMS paramedics to come work in the hospital. Yeah. And, you know, I even have friends who are in the medical field as well. And they, and I think it, again, it could be the pandemic and the burnout rate and that, but, but it just may be that the grass is greener on the other side but when looking at like tech companies or, you know, media and things like that, where their jobs have like way more perks and it doesn't seem as, um, as stressful because they're not dealing with patients too, but, um, but yeah, okay, next slide. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about where I got it. Okay, so <laughs> it's a long story of jobs that I've had <laughs> as a PA. 
Um, my first job upon graduating was in peds neurology. Um, I wanted to do plastics or neurosurgery right off the bat. Um, but I, I couldn't get a job in those two things because I didn't have any, I have any experience really. And they, and especially with surgery, they want some sort of surgical experience. So I would say for people who want to go into plastics in their future, I probably should have taken a surgical, even gen surge job right off the bat. Um, because everyone looked at peds neurology and was like, there's no surgery in there. <laughs> so, but peds neurology was a huge challenge. Um, I barely got, I mean, I may have had like two lectures during PA school and um, I went, I was interviewing it all over in different specialties, but for some reason I ended up in peds neurology because I liked, I liked the staff <laughs> and I liked the location. It was in, um, in uh, at New York Methodist Hospital in Brooklyn. So I like the location and I really like my supervising position. I just felt like really at home there and she was great. And uh, I learned so much, probably the most I've ever learned. <laughs> it was during, during those two years there. Um, and we did everything from like infantile spasms to, um, to developmental delay. We dealt with ADD, we dealt with even bipolar, like psychiatric issues that people would come to their neurologist, pediatric neurologist for um, congenital abnormalities, genetics. It was just like a whole spectrum of things that I've never done before in PA school. And so that was like amazing. And I'm still very close with my, um, with my supervising position at the time. Um, and then after that, um, Right after that, in 2014, my brother passed away. So I took like a one year um, kind of one year off, so to speak. Um, they, hospitals give you only three days of, of grieving period. And I didn't think that was enough. <laughs> so um, at the time, my parents already had moved to Canada and I have a lot of extended family in Canada. So that's where the Canadian part comes in. So I came to Canada after my brother passed because I had no more family left in New York. And I spent a year, I was working in my mom's hair salon, which she had opened up here. And I also got involved with the Canadian Association Physician Assistant Program here, um, which is CAPA. So when you're in Toronto advocating for the profession. Um, and the program started about, mm, I think it's on its, 13th year now. Um, so it's still in its baby steps um, in the province of Ontario and started actually in the province of uh, Manitoba about 18 years or oh, 20 years ago now. Um, so it was still new to Ontario region. Um, um, after that, I needed to go back to work and I couldn't find any jobs in Canada. So <clears throat> I started looking at locum tenens, which are placements like um, traveling positions. So I applied for my California license and I did that for one and a half years. Um, and that was in primary care. Um, that one was really tough because um, if you've never done traveling positions before and you've only had Pete Neuro as an experience, it's, there is no training period. They want you in there. You're in rural areas. You're seeing like 30 patients a day. And it's, it's really hard. You have to be fast and you have to do everything. It's not just, you know, you can't just refer out to a specialty because you can't do it there. Like you have to be, you're, you're the OBGYN, you're the dermatologist. You're, you're pretty much every special, every specialty in a rural area. So I would definitely say if you're thinking about, I mean, the money is great and you get to travel. Um, but I would say if you're planning on doing a traveling PA or even traveling nurse, it's, I think it's very similar where it's like, it's very intense. So you have to be prepared for that. Um, there's not any, there's no handholding. <laughs> I will start looking things up myself. Like, um, so, and then after that, I was like, all right, I need to come back home and I need to be closer. Ultimately my goal at that point was like to be back in Canada with my, with my family. Um, and I wanted to do plastics. So that was my goal even back then. So I was like, okay, I need experience in this. I'm going to apply for any type of plastic surgical job there is in any state <laughs> there is because I just need to get in. So I applied to a lot of 
any, I applied to pretty much every single opening in plastic surgery. And I landed a job in Cooperstown, New York, um, which has a baseball hall of fame. And it's also a rural area. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, but um, I did that for three years and that was pretty amazing. It was reconstructive plastics along with cosmetic plastics. And here we did everything ranging from hand surgery to reconstructive breast mastectomy surgeries. Um, we did gender reassignment surgeries. Um, we did lots of flaps for skin cancers. Um, we even did amputations like BKAs, um, like pretty much everything, everything involving the skin we did <laughs> um, and the wrists and the hand. Um, so that was a, an incredible experience. I also, during that time, I also worked um, call shifts for ortho and ENT. So I got that experience as well. And um, after that, I started applying, in my third year of reconstructive plastics, I started applying for um, plastic surgical jobs back in Toronto. And they, did, they still didn't have a lot of job openings. Um, they didn't even have the job opening for plastics PA. The job title on Indeed was um, an OR assist. So I applied and I got in. <laughs> um, so that brings me to now where I am today. And um, as I mentioned before, um, I'm doing, I'm mostly operating in, in the, I mostly OR assist and I see follow-ups occasionally, but that's my primary position from day to day life. So I start at 7 a.m. and we go, because it's a private clinic, we don't have the restrictions of um, a hospital facility of like stop, stop operations at five and then the, the night shift comes in. Um, we can operate at any time or any day of the week we, that we would like to. Um, so we have that leisure. Do you, cover um, the emer do you cover the emergency room? Currently? Uh, yes. Oh, no, no. It's a private, it's a private clinic. It's a private cosmetic right. clinic. I, I didn't know if you did a hospital call or not. No, no, not my current position. I did do that in my previous position in plastics in um, Cooperstown, New York. Well, you've got to be super good at doing exams to, to have been a pediatric neurologist uh, PA for two years. <laughs> by far and away in my shop, the most impressive exams I see are by the neurology team. They are so thorough. <laughs> I'm humbled whenever they come down. Yeah. And the note writing is insane. Like, I think it was like, I, I my notes were like three pages long. From <laughs> so, and even reading um, EEGs, the... Um, um, for seizures was pretty, was pretty cool. Uh, I would say probably Pete's neurology was the most like medical medicine based job that I had out of all of them. Do, um, do you still have your tuning fork? <laughs> uh, yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> and I have my like little ophthalmoscope, um, the tunnel one. And I had a different type of uh, reflex hammer. It wasn't your traditional triangle one. It was, it was, <laughs> something that something else um but yeah like it, it really made me pay attention to the physical exam and um even like uh the development stages of infancy um including like in the NICU from from NICU all the way we saw patients up to like age 18 so we saw a wide variety of people doing a neuro exam on a six-month-old my goodness yeah it's, it's possible though <laughs> Please go on, please. This is wonderful. We're getting some we're getting some great questions. We got you lined up for some really good questions. Okay. <laughs> well, I have more of my presentation. So <laughs> next slide. Okay. Um, I don't know why I titled it this. I guess I was trying to make it interesting, but I'm just gonna talk now about um, the healthcare systems between uh, Canada and the US. Just briefly, just like a brief overview because um, I was gonna be here all night. <laughs> um, okay, so next slide. So, okay, so we have the US, which has privatized insurance, and then we have the partially funded healthcare for low income elderly and children. And then compare that to Canada, which is a universally funded healthcare system for all age groups. Um, only if you have legal status here. So you have to be, you have to have a work permit, you have to have um, a permanent residency, um, or you have to be a legal citizen. Um, otherwise, if you're not a legal citizen, if you're here illegally, um, then you're not covered. 
So you can't pay for coverage. Um, and it's very difficult to pay out of pocket. They'll still see you in the emergency department, but um, that's about it. Like, prescriptions, are not, prescriptions are not covered, really? Yeah, a lot of people are under the impression that, oh, Canada is universally funded, you get free health care. And, and they think that with free health care, you get um, prescription coverage, but actually that's not the case. So it's, it's kind of weird. I mean, there's like benefits to the healthcare system here. Prescription coverage. Like, so I have like additional benefits, which include like my prescription coverage and um, ophthalmology and eye exam and, um, and what else does it include? And physical therapy. So like, those are not typically covered by universal healthcare. Universal healthcare is just like, and then no dental coverage as well. That doesn't include dental. So it's just seeing your, your doctor and your specialist and that's pretty much it. Does GoodRx sell in Canada and other discount? Um, yeah, so, uh, so, we, so let's hop over to the next slide because I will talk more about uh, prescriptions in the US because we know that's like super inflated in the US. So US, <laughs> even though we pay for insurance there, it's, there are prescription coverage, um, but that means that there's a higher cost of meds and I think that's part because insurance does cover a lot of meds. And as I mentioned earlier about, you know, these um, pharmaceutical companies dropping so much money when they introduce a medication, um, they love introducing it to the states because they know that they'll get, you know, a return of their investment. Um, uh, and there's no real stop. There's no real like uh, stop to the the prescription cost. So every time there's a new med, I found, I found that, you know, it'd be completely unaffordable to a lot of people. Um, so, um, but in Canada, you know, they mostly use the generic and, and that's pretty much it. And there, it's much cheaper. I don't know why, like even brand names, brand names are slightly more expensive, but they're not as expensive as in the States. So I don't, I don't know why that is. I picked up a prescription on GoodRx the other day for something or other, antibiotic, I think. Retail, $154. On GoodRx, it was $4. <laughs> yeah, so, so I don't know what the regulation is on, on prescriptions, and I think it's a big issue, um, especially for the states. Um, um, so, and I thought there was going to be something implemented governmental, government-wise, but I don't think that ever happened. Um, so first to be on the market. So yes, like I mentioned earlier, they want drug companies love putting it on the market first in the US and, and it, it may be beneficial to you to patients in the US because they can have access to it first. Um, and because of the insurance based healthcare, you can get reimbursed directly to from the healthcare insurances. So um, I think that generates more jobs. Um, so there's more, way more healthcare workers in U.S. than there are in Canada. I mean, even compared to the, the population size, of course, because there's far less people in Canada. Um, U.S. has way more hospital, way more hospitals and more hospital beds, ICU beds. Um, and that became a factor during the pandemic when our ICU beds were very full and we had to go into lockdown like three times already. We actually were in a lockdown in January. Um, so that was most recent, um, just because our IC, we don't have that many ICU beds and, you know, we were at capacity, even though capacity in the States would have been like at 50% compared to, um, Canada. Um, so yeah, so it's also fee for service. So you get as NPs and PAs, we get reimbursed directly from the insurance company. So I can bill every time I see a patient, if every time I do a procedure and in Canada, um, I can't do the same thing. So it becomes an issue when it comes to funding PAs in Canada. Um, next slide. So um, just to, I'm just gonna jump down a few bullets just because I wanna talk about NPs. Um, so NPs in Canada can practice independently and they get direct reimbursement from their provincial health insurance company. So, which is OHIP here in Ontario. And um, PAs are not yet regulated in, in, in Ontario and um, it's difficult to fund PAs and, and that's why there's not a lot of PA opportunities because people have a hard time funding us. Um, but there are methods to fund us. Um, and 
they don't have nurse anesthetists in Canada. So they don't have like that full family health team that we've kind of created in the States um, where all that support, um, like medical assistant, nurse, um, like uh, PA, NP, and then like you have that whole group of people. Whereas Canada, I think is limited in how many people per patient there is. So um, that's a big difference. And I think that comes into play because of how it's funded. Um, and then going back to the first bullet, baseline drugs are usually cheaper. Um, so they use, so they use some, so I noticed that they use a different differences of medication. So like for here, for, for nausea, um, they'll use something called gravel, which is diamond hydronate, which can create, which can create drowsiness as well. Um, but they'll use that first because it's more cost effective for hospitals to utilize it than it is to use like Odansetron. Um, and I, th I thought that was insane because I've never even heard of gravel <laughs> as a trained PA in the States. And I was just like, what is this? You know, and it's just a cheaper method to treat nausea. Um, it's not as effective, but they use it first line because again, you know, it's coming out of pocket from like the taxpayer dollar. So they want to use the cheapest method. And um, um, it takes longer to get in with a family doctor here. So you go to your family doctor and it's rare to see a specialist unless absolutely needed. Um, so there's a little bit of a wait time, but, you know, I think that's a little bit of a difference between here and the States. Um, and I already mentioned that PAs are not regulated. Um, and so here, something else that I've noticed is that they use IMGs, international medical graduates for um, like private practices. Um, they can't use them in hospitals because they're, they're, they're not regulated. So basically people who come over as like doctors from other countries, um, but don't go through their steps and don't go through um, getting board certified in Canada are still utilized as like, as quote unquote PA, they're called PAs here. And it's like a little bit uh, disturbing to hear that. But I mean, at the same time, it's like a cheaper way of, of having, having that extra extra pair of hands without paying a PA or another physician. So that's like another thing that they have here. Um, and retired docs. And so, and so in the hospital setting, um, who assists with surgeries is that they get retired doctors to come in and assist with surgeries. And they could be general doctors, like primary care doctors that assist because they can bill directly to OHIP. They get more money for the surgery um, versus hiring a PA, which I can't, you can't, you can include me, but you won't get, you won't get more money if you, if you bill um, the insurance company. Hey Doris, um, we've had PAs speak to us previously here, quite a few actually. Um, can NPs prescribe narcotic schedule drugs in Canada? because I think they cannot in the States. So actually, um, I'm not sure about that. I don't think they can either here, um, but neither can I, neither can I as a PA. Okay, that's cool. In Canada, yeah. Um, yeah, nor PA that, license in, in the States. I, as far as I'm aware, nor can PAs in the States as well. Oh, this is uh, great, please I, keep going. I can prescribe, oh, with a DA license, I can prescribe narcotics. Um, okay, cool. In the States only I'm speaking. I mean, in Canada, no, Canada, no. Uh, okay. Um, I was thinking it was under the authorized authorization of your authorizing doc, but maybe you can in independently prescribe. I, I don't know. I, you York, had your own, you had your own DEA number in the, as a PA in the States. In New York state. Yes. And, oh, cool. and so California. you could. So I think, I think there's different like bylaws, um, for PAs in, in different States. Okay, doke. Thank you. This is great. Please keep going. Okay. Um, next slide. Oh, wait. Sorry. Can you go back one? I think, was there another one? Oh, okay. Maybe not. Sorry. Go back. Sorry. Next slide. <laughs> um, this is just a comparison about PAs in, in Canada. And I put New York State because obviously there's not, population-wise, there's not that many um, people here. So um, 1300 PAs across Canada, I think it's actually a little bit less than that. I, I just haven't, they haven't redone it in a while. The last time I checked it was a thousand, but I'm just assuming there's 1300. Um, and the average starting salary is 85,000. And in New York state, um, there's about 14,000 and 142,000 across the US of PAs. 
and the our average starting salary now, I just like Google this, but I don't know if this is accurate, but it's 118,000, that's what I Googled. Next slide. Okay, um, just more added things about Canadian healthcare. Um, the first round of IVF is covered here under your um, universally funded health insurance, which is kind of nice. Um, this is more social um, benefit um, that you get one year maternity leave versus the States, which is like three months disability. Um, and um, yeah, they don't cover circumcisions and they don't cover majority of transgender surgeries here because it's universally funded and there's no dental coverage, which I mentioned earlier. Um, but, you know, because of privatized insurance in the States, you know, the, I think some of those things are still covered. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, this is just a quote um, that was fun. So just living is not enough. One must have sunshine, freedom, and a little flower. Um, so as a PA here, you know, I lost the majority of my autonomy <laughs> and um, financial means to be with my family. So uh, I, I've come up with like, I'm starting on something on my own um, with the help of my supervising physician. And it's gonna be like an adjunct side, side thing to the clinic. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about it. So next slide. Um, so I came to the realization that hard work doesn't pay off despite what Dr. Fowler may say. Um, and I was just thinking long-term about what am I gonna, if I'm gonna stay in Canada, like, and I'm making significantly less based off of just being a PA in my profession, I need, I need to strategize and, and have my own way of an investments and I could invest in property and I was just thinking of other things. Um, but ultimately I thought I could open up my own business. Um, so, um, I'm executing the plan of educating myself. So I'm doing a lot of online, not online courses, sorry, I'm actually taking a few courses. Um, and for those out there that are like looking at courses, even if you're graduated and you're working, I say, go for courses, go for conferences. They're never a waste of your money or your time. Um, just because you learn so much and, and that education can never be taken away from you. And it just makes you very well-rounded, even if it's like something not to do with your field. Um, I, I just found that it made, just made me well-rounded and I, and I use certain concepts and techniques from other specialties and I've applied it even within plastics or even within like my other pre-screening job. It's just, it just makes you view things differently. Um, so I would say, don't ever say, oh, this course is too much money or, oh, I can't afford to pay for that right now because I think education, if it involves education or advancing your knowledge on, on a topic and gives you the confidence to do it, I would say definitely do it. So next slide. So my, my game plan is um, I'm starting a scar therapy clinic which treats scars like basically from A to Z um, assessment of the scars. Um, we see scars all day, post-operative scars. Um, it really affects people and how they view themselves and how they view their bodies. Um, and it could be burn scars, it could be um, you know, tra traumatic scars. Um, so I just recently took a course in scar camouflage tattoo. I mean, I already know how to treat scars um, if they're hyperpigmented. So, um, um, First, we'll be addressing like the texture of the scar. Sometimes you could have um, hypertrophic scars um, and you look at the pigmentation. Um, and over here, that's actually a picture of me um, and during the course and I, I'm tattooing it. Um, over on the far right picture is a, a patient who had a split thickness skin graft from a trauma and um, the result was a hypertrophic scar, but it was like very, very textured. So we're just applying like a micro needling technique to help smooth that out, uh, first before we apply any type of pigment to there. Um, I also used to do, uh, and I'm going to continue to do a three, 3D areola micropigmentation, which is for, um, mastectomy reconstruction. It's also for areolas that have been, have no, have necrosis through after surgery and they need um, a touch up of their pigment. So next slide. 
Um, so this is some of the work that I've done over on the left hand side um, of the screen, um, 3D areola tattooing. Um, so it can be used to create areolas for patients who have underwent mastectomies, as I mentioned, gender affirmation areolas. So the patient on the um, below um, is a transgender uh, female to male, um, had breast removed and uh, they couldn't spare the areolas. Um, so I tattooed them in. And the patient on the top portion um, had a nipple repair as well, but um, so th that would be more of like a 4D areola tattoo. Um, and again, you don't really even have to be a PA to do this or in the medical field, you can just, if you want to tattoo, med do medical aesthetics, medical tattooing, then you can do that. So, um, but it's nice to incorporate that into my practice so I can, you know, treat the patient again from like A to Z of like, like the pigment being the final, the final um, touch. Um, and then on the, on the right is the hypopigmented, hypopigmented scar. And that's, that's right after I just uh, did a scar camouflage tattooing. So that, that's not the healed result yet. I don't have the healed result yet, but four weeks I will. <laughs> Next slide. Um, also in the scar therapy, it's, uh, I think there's a lot of advancements right now in plastics with um, fat transfers. Um, so um, I do plan on implementing a fat transfers um, as part of the scar therapy solution. Um, it uses your own autologous fat and fat actually has a great deal of stem cells within it, um, specifically the SVF, which is the stromal vascular fraction. Um, that's the, the adipose tissue that has that great deal of um, stem cells. And it's great for skin, skin rejuvenation. It's being used now to treat um, radiated skin, um, which is essentially a burn, um, scar adhesions and burn contractures. Um, there's a lot of advancements now with, with that. So, um, so it's pretty neat to see it. Um, next slide. Um, and then this, the study on the upper left-hand corner is about fat grafting on scars, wounds, and burns. Um, and there's a lot of great results from it. So I'm hoping I can sh shadow um, one of my uh, attendings and, and, and perform this as well. Um, and exosomes are also a new, new thing on the market in plastics. Um, they're using it now for like hair, hair rejuvenation. Um, and, and these are extracellular vesicles that carry um, RNA and DNA protein in it. Um, and they, they help with tissue repair, tissue regeneration. Um, and they're almost like nano carriers for, for stem cells. So they rejuvenate the, like regrow the, the cells. Um, they are not FDA approved yet, but some people are still using them um, just because um, they, because of the, um, because of the way that they are introduced, they can't like they can't exactly say if it's 100% safe or not based off of the RNA. If it's like a hybrid um, introduction of exosomes, so but that's something like in the future that is pretty cool to see. Um, you can see like the results on the far um, right hand corner. It's like pretty neat for um, it's uh, yeah. It's so deforming for someone to have their nail bed messed up and they end up with an odd, weird finger. And that's a, that's a beautiful result uh, yeah. to, make them, to make them a new nail. Yeah, um, that's sort of like, that's like the part of plastics that I'm just like, oh my God, you know, I see, <laughs> I like love. <laughs> um, we, we've had a nice question. Uh, Nicole asked us, can you talk a little bit more about using fat transfer in breast augmentations? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so we do use them actually here in the clinic in breast augmentation. Um, if it's used as a replacement of breast augmentation, you only get, you know, instead of an implant, you can use, you can transfer fat to the area, but you only get about like a half a cup, like half a cup full fuller with the fat transfer versus like if you needed like more of an augmentation, like larger breasts, then I would say go for the implant. Um, but also they use fat transfers to fill in uh, cleavage. Some people have wide set breasts and, and they use it to fill in the cleavage area. Um, they use it for mastectomy patients, again, to create that pendular like um, look, because sometimes after mastectomy when all that breast tissue is taken away, 
um, you know, the chest wall doesn't appear to be the same. So they mm -hmm. use fat transfers for that as well. Um, but yeah, for breast augmentation, you can, I wouldn't say, unless you're looking for to go much bigger, um, fat transfers are just like a half, half a cup size increase because half of that, even though we can, we can put in more, um, fat cells tend to die. Like about 50% of those fat cells will die off. So you don't transfer their, um, uh, vasculature with them? Um, no, with, with fat? No, no. It's not like a flap or anything like that. Oh, oh, okay. We suck out the fat via liposuction in a sterile environment, and then we re-inject it um, back in. So There was an interesting article in JAMA today looking at uh, perhaps over-sensitivity of uh, mammography mammograms mm -hmm. in terms of detecting masses. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that's going to play out down the road. Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. I didn't, I didn't get to read that one yet, but. Yeah. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, um, and this brings us to the last portion of the, um, of my presentation, which is a case study. So um, we have a 25 year old female, she's status post uh, br uh, breast, bilateral breast augmentation DBA. And um, she had a, hold on, I can't see, I can't see my slide, oh, actually, can I, oh wait, no, whoops, how do I minimize this? Oh, there we go. Okay, so she had a unilateral um, left-sided lift um, back in 2021, and she came today for a follow-up. Um, the patient noticed that the left-sided implant has dropped. Um, she initially noticed this about eight months post-operatively, but at the time she was advised to wear like a supportive bra and like come back in three months. So today's visit, the breast implant is sitting below the IMF, which is inframammary fold. And there's more breast tissue on the left lower pole. And our plan was to do a surgical revision. Um, we'll go more into like her before and after. She had a lot of asymmetry to begin with. Um, so, See. Okay, next slide. Oh, the next slide is the video. Oh, sorry. No, this is the, the implants. This is a typical, I just wanted to show you guys what a typical, um, um, this is Allergan Neutral implant looks like. There's different brands, of course. There's Mentor. Um, uh, but this is, this was her implant. She had 420 cc saline. Um, and the 68 MP is the style. And then MP stands for moderate profile. So there's different profiles. Um, of how the, the, you want the implant to look. So there's high profile, which is like the really bubbly round look. And the moderate profile is more of like a, um, like more of a, what they call natural look. Mm -hmm. And then 420 is the size. And then you can fill those saline implants a little bit beyond their, their size. So you can fill that to like 480 with no issues. Um, and all the implants that we use are smooth. We no longer use texture though. That, that was like gone <laughs> since for a while now. Um, and yeah, and then it comes with a little fill tube and we just pump in saline. Um, okay, next slide. Do you still do silicones or no? Oh yeah, we do silicone. Um, I think it's more of like a surgical preference or the patient preference. Um, like my, one of my surgeons like loves saline. He finds that they're not necessarily safer, but if they rupture, you can tell right away and it's the reabsorption is just saline. So, um, but some people like, you know, some patients will opt, still opt for silicone, um, even though there's more upkeep in it. So uh, just an FYI, I have the video pulled up here in a separate tab. So let me reshare my screen in just a second here. Okay. And we'll have that video pulled up for everyone. Okay, I'm gonna share again. Okay. All right, can y'all see the screen? Yes, sir. All right, perfect. I will play now. So this is um my supervising doctor, Dr. Eugenberg, aka Dr. S the real Dr. Six. <laughs> um, if you're interested in more of his surgeries. Um, you go to Snapchat, everything's like unedited. It's like raw cut surgery. So he, he's really big on, on teaching. 
So um, take a look here. This is a patient before her surgery, like before we even put implants in, and then he'll he'll talk you through it. So hit it. <laughs> okay, so we're back to have a revision on patient piece, the breast cementation and balancing lift. This is a patient before her surgery. So she had two very different breasts, one small, one bigger, droopy one. We did a breast cementation on her right side and a breast cementation and a lift, a slight reduction on the left to make them look symmetrical. And she looked pretty good on the table. But over time, her left breast has fallen. And we are now here. It's still bigger. It's more droopy. So I'm going to go in and do a revision of her device of breast mount. Take a little more tissue out and then probably do an internal graph to support the breast tissue that's falling down give her better symmetry. We'll open things up, we'll see what things look like, uh, whether or not the implant is falling. If it's just a glandular tissue, then we simply remove the glandular tissue. But if the breast implant actually is falling itself, I may have to reinforce the breast fold and either put stitches in the breast fold or use a little mesh to create an internal bra. So we so, yeah, so yeah for this case, you just, what? the epithelialize that part of the, of the, um, the areola, the tissue. uh, tissues, and then, the implant itself actually is sitting well. It's sitting at a breast fold. It's not falling too low. I'll take a closer look. We'll open things up. I may not need to do an internal bra any support. Simply just reshape the glandular tissue that may be all that we need to do. So we'll, we'll, we'll see once things open up. But we're starting out with this, and I'm trying to preserve the dermis, the white stuff, to use it for support should I need to use extra support. We've, we've exposed the implant. The implant is sitting right there. I'm going to put a little mesh that goes from the breast fold to the back muscle. The back muscle is right there, so we we'll span it. It's going to act like a little internal bra, and then we'll close everything up and reshape the breast tissue on top of it. So we'll be using this mesh as internal bra. I'm going to embed it in, so we it in like you know, as we see us soaking um, implants in beating. We're going to take a mesh. Now it's big. We don't need all of this. It's a big piece. We'll cut it. We use alloderm for this part too. Um, some people will use alloderm, um, acellular and dermal matrix. Everything's kind of brownish, I guess you can see, but I'm suturing the mesh to the muscle on top. A few stitches here. Well, this looks like absorbable suture, is it? Yeah, they're all absorbable sutures that we use. Um, and actually, even the mesh itself, it's a Vicro mesh, so it's absorbable. There are permanent non-absorbable meshes, um, but this one is absorbable, so it'll probably get reabsorbed by the surrounding tissue. It's just for added support, so that way the implant doesn't fall below the IMF, which is like a double bubble or bottoming out. Um, like support. Come on up to the trackers. We still have a little left over. Kind of like creating like a little hammock or a sling for the implant. There will be support. So Doris, can we try it here? That's me. You said Doris. There's Doris. Um, so <laughs> if the mesh resorbs, the mesh right there, how does the uh, implant, the implant stay elevated? It's the mesh and the mesh is holding it in place. So it's, so like it's just. It just heals that way, so it heals down and it creates like a scar tissue and almost like a like a capsule, like that creates like that pocket. So Form, that's forms cool. its own capsule and scars down. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we are done with this breast mount revision, internal bra removal of some glandular tissue. Try to improve the symmetry between these two breasts. So she had a significant amount of asymmetry to begin with, and even though we removed breast tissue in the initial surgery. Um, as possible. The implant kind of dropped down and so did some of the glandular breast tissue. So I think he did remove some of that too as well. And we lifted everything back up. Um, we can play the next slide. It's just the, the next one is a hyperlapse video um, basically of the entire surgery. Yes, let me pull that one up as well. Um, so the way he cut, the way he cut, uh, made his incisions into the um, the breast is not just like, you know, it just doesn't cut it and like fillet it open, um, even though that's what it seems like. Um, we have to keep in mind uh, about the blood supply to the areola, um, the nipple areola complex, um, along with the surrounding glandular tissue. Um, so is, the, uh, is the sensation preserved? Um, yeah, usually the sensation is preserved. They, they may be numb for the first couple of weeks, but usually, you know, in a healthy young patient, you know, it'll, the nerve cells will regenerate. 
Um, so that's usually not a problem. Um, yeah. Um, okay, you can you can press play. That's fine. Sorry. This is just like a hyperlapse of of the same surgery, and then I'm more in this one, I think, too, because it's like an overhead, like an overhead view, and that's me like assisting. Um, so that's just like a little bit of what I do on a regular basis. Um, do you uh, suture a fair amount, also, Doris? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I figured so. Uh, um, I worked closely with a PA years ago who worked with a plastic surgeon and she was an artist with that 7-0 She could make, <laughs> she could, she taught me to do a beautiful closure. Yeah. 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 I, I really enjoy suturing. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to be in the operating room. Um, so yeah, that's just beta dye that we threw in there. Um, yeah, so just the blood supply um, for people that want to know for the the breast. Again, you have to keep in mind every time you cut it open, you have to you have to preserve the blood supply to the areola. So in this case, he created like what we call a pedicle. Um, so he cut out a super medial pedicle, and we typically some people some physicians like to use a inferior pedicle. It just depends on the location of how of where you want the areola to be moved. Um, so some of the main, the main blood supply is from the internal thoracic artery um, and that branches out um, via the like anterior perforators. Um, and then there's the intercostal perforators that also provide um, a vascular supply. Um, and that's it, that's me suturing right there, the areola. <laughs> the areola suturing queen <laughs> between that and the uh, the aerial 3D micropigmentation, it's like, it all comes together. <laughs> what size uh, suture would you use on the, the areola? So, um, so that, what I'm using right there is a 4.0 monocryl, which is an absorbable suture. And I use it in a subcuticular pattern. Um, we also did a lot of deep dermal sutures with the 3.0 vicryl. That's amazing. And then um, I have a after photo, how she's doing in her follow-up a few weeks later. Usually for recovery for these patients, it's about like six weeks with no heavy lifting. They can do light exercise activities um, and they're typically put on antibiotics um, just because of the implant, any foreign body that you have, you wanna make sure that there's no um, chance of infection. They'll be swelling for a while, right? Yeah, they'll be swelling for a while, yes. And, and this, you know, so that's her before and after. So, yeah. Were the hearts uh, tattoos that you put on? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, also, you really shouldn't be tattooing in white because uh, it doesn't fade very well on the skin. <laughs> it tends to fade to yellow. <laughs> um, next slide. What's the longest surgery you've scrubbed in on? Um, like throughout my career or in just in cosmetic plastics? Uh, pick one, whatever. Um, I would say, I don't know if it was the longest, but like I, I scrubbed in, I assisted on when I was on call with the, uh, neural neurosurgeon, it was like a lumbar something. Like, I don't even remember what it was. Um, it was a discectomy. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what it was, but we were operating until like 2 AM. And I think we started at like 2 PM. <laughs> So that was a long time. Yeah. And, and he, he never scrubbed out. Like I, I had to scrub out at least once, you know, but I, I'm pretty, I think I'm pretty disciplined and resilient, but you know, even like in the surgeries here, I barely scrub out. Like I don't, you know, I, I can last at least four to five hours, maybe six hours max without anything just being scrubbed in. Wonderful, wonderful. We have, this is a terrific presentation. Thank you so much, Doris. Uh, Thank you. We have a host of questions and we'll try to limit them to uh, oh, five or six. Uh, Shayan, you want to take it away? Yes, sir. So thank you so much, Doris, for sharing your story with us. Um, all of our students uh, must be very excited to uh, learn more about your field. So uh, we do have some questions here. One of the uh, questions I see was, uh, how did you apply to PA programs in high school and what programs did you apply to? 
Um, how did I apply? I mean, I filled out the college applications. <laughs> I, don't, I don't exactly remember because it was a while ago. Um, but I had all my prerequisites and I looked on, um, I applied to Wagner College, which, which is in Staten Island. I applied to Rutgers University. Um, just these are some of the ones I remember. I think I applied to like six total, um, or maybe six or seven, because there's like always an application fee with all of them. So it kind of get, can get very expensive. Um, I applied to Seton Hall and what else did I apply to? And St. John's University. That's the ones I remember. I think there's two more that were like, um, I think were CUNY colleges. So, um, but yeah, I think I went on their website. I looked up all their like requests and, and I got it done and I submitted it. Well, thank you. And then I had to go through an interview process and, um, and then, yeah, and I got selected. And at first I made the waiting list on the place that I wanted to go to, and then I got selected. Well, I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> All right, so uh, our next question here is, did PA school prepare you to handle the challenges as a practicing PA? And what knowledge gaps did you have when you first started working as a PA? Um, well, I mean, PA school prepared me in the sense where that, um, I can look anything up. Um, I don't think I was prepared for everything, but uh, you have to do a lot of your own work too. Um, you have to do a lot of your own research. You have to do a lot of your own studies and commitment outside of PE school. Um, and you may get lucky and have someone that's a really good teacher or like really, um, really trusts you and, and, wants, and wants to teach you. Um, but majority of it, I really looked up on my own. Um, my first job, like as I mentioned earlier, was Pete's Neurology. So I had two lectures throughout my, throughout all of my PA school, which was hardly enough um, in the topic. And I learned a lot on the job. Um, and I think that's a discussion to have when you get hired is that, you know, the honesty between you and your, um, your, your physician that, you know, you're willing to learn, you have to put effort into learning. Um, you can't just sit back and do nothing, but you also have, uh, you also have a ways to learn because you don't have that much experience. So I think you should really be honest and upfront about it, um, but with a determination to be open to learning and to be challenged and get some, you know, maybe some negative feedback and, you know, you have to accept that. That's right. Thank you very much. Um, you know, here's a common question I feel like a lot of students have about the field. Uh, so since PAs are not locked into certain specialties like physicians are after completing residency, how easy is it for PAs to switch between several specialties that may appear unrelated? And are there any requirements like extra training or do employers train you on the job when you switch specialties? Yeah, so I switched specialties quite a bit. <laughs> I did PEDS Neuro, I did primary care, um, and then I did reconstructive plastics. And throughout reconstructive plastics, I did orthopedic surgery, and then I did ENT, neurosurge, and then and, um, plastics now again. And I also do pre-screenings for, <laughs> for phase one trials. And um, compared to my other classmates, I would say no one else has switched specialties at all. They've all stayed through it from day one. Um, dermatology, you know, they may have switched from like primary care to urgent care like that kind of like that close relationship, but nothing as drastic as I, what I have done. And um, it's not that easy. It's, you really have to, you really have to be up for the challenge and like start again and, you know, study again and, and, and take criticism. It's, it's really, it's really hard. <laughs> you as a PA Doris, do you have to recertify periodically? Yeah. So when I graduated, it was six years still. And then the year after I graduated is every 10 years. So I already recertified my six year mark. And then now I have to recertify in 10 years. So, but the IRA Emergen in 2018, I think it was. Hmm? Emergency medicine went from 10 years to five now. Oh, really? Yeah. <clears throat> Though I am recertified to age 77. Do you think I'll make it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, and you. again, <laughs> recertify again. <laughs> Um, well, can you um, just jump over to the next slide so we can, I can just, I have my contact information there. Oh, yeah. um, 
And I, I didn't put my contact of the, the doctor that I work with, but he's huge on social media. Um, my team is called si at six surgery. Um, the Snapchat is the real doctor six. Um, so, and he's very big on teaching, especially surgeries and things like that. So cool. are there any right. other questions or? Yeah. So I guess uh, one that might be asked by a lot of the students as well. So how do you, uh, have a work-life balance what are some things that you do in your life that kind of allow you to have that work-life balance if you have one next question <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah no um no work-life balance i know people some people choose the pa career because oh they get work-life balance and whatnot um even though i'm like three days a week 12 hour shifts so to speak but it ends up being more than that. It's it's a real commitment. Anything in medicine that you do is a commitment. It's a dedication. Um, I think if you're a doctor, it's more of a dedication and a commitment. And a lot of your family doesn't understand that or like loved ones or significant others won't understand that. Um, and I think, and I, I don't wanna sound like gender based or whatever, but I, I think it's, there's more pressure of that for a female. Um, just cause I think, I think there's expectations of us being around a lot more and um I don't know I feel like for guys it's a little different but I'm not trying to say that it's not it's I'm not trying to be gender neutral here I don't use it as an excuse but it's difficult to have a work-life balance as a PA um and you may have that depending on the job that you have but some people do it well, that's good um, you know, I have one last question here, unless Dr. Fowler has anything else to add, but don't want to keep you too long here. Um, so another question they asked, you know, what are your restrictions in the OR? Do you mostly do skin grafts and retract or do you have other responsibilities as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we don't do any skin grafts because it's not a reconstructive um, practice. It's more um, cosmetic. So, but yeah, there is a lot of retracting still, but I also do liposuctioning. Um, and I do a lot of suturing too. I inject local, I can, I do small procedures outside of the OR, like draining seromas, um, doing revisions under local anesthetics for like, um, uh, wound care and debridement and things like that. Mm. So there's a little bit of autonomy there. Um, I don't do the entire surgery myself, of course, <laughs> I can't do that, but um i'm pretty i'm pretty involved yeah well that's good to hear so doris you. uh doris are you burning out or are you doing fine um, <laughs> um i think i'm doing okay i think i have um <clears throat> i think it's always like up and down i'm very i'm very motivated i'm very um i'm a go-getter type of person so when I'm the when there's like a lull in my in my life or my career, I'm like, okay, what am I doing now? Like, where do I go from here? And so I'm, I'm as I mentioned in my slides, I am planning on starting like a little side side thing <laughs> with my doctor, and I think I think that's gonna take off pretty well, especially with the scar with the scar revision, the scar therapy. I took one of our uh, graduating residents uh, out to a bar uh, this weekend to celebrate his graduation. He said. So, Dr. Fowler, do you, uh, uh, you know, when are you going to retire or do you, do you even like coming to work? <laughs> I'm a single guy with no kids. I said, you know, the most social thing I do is at work. You know, my best friends are there, including all of this working group. You know, we hang out, hang out with each other and all that. So I, I don't know if I'm an oddity, but I like going to work. I, I enjoy seeing people, hearing their stories, talking about them and uh, finding out, you know, what, where, you know, emergency medicine. We solve some things up front, pneumonia and whatnot, but we refer a lot of people, including the plastic surgeons. So, uh, you know, I enjoy being part of the story of people. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I have all my friends are from work, you know, coming to another a different city. You know, I'm still pretty new here. I don't have a lot of roots here. So um, all my friends are in Staten Island and um, yeah, I, I made a lot of friends through work and we have a lot of events here and it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice work family. Well, Shayan, I think you've got one more slide, don't you? Yes, I do. Let me get that ready right now. So this is, let me open that. 
Okay, so this is going to be the uh, QR code for the quiz for this session. Um, so it's going to be due by 6.59 p.m. Central Time on May 10th, 2022, or obviously this year, <laughs> and it's going to be actually next Tuesday night. So you have two attempts to score a 70% or higher in order to pass, uh, but just please make sure to download that certificate as soon as you complete the quiz. That way you get credit for the, um, attending the session. So you can keep track of the, the hours that you get. So, but we want to thank Doris for her time with us tonight and for sharing her story. Uh, Dr. Fowler, did you have any final words? Well, Doris, tonight you had um, almost 300 students from around the world mesmerized with this amazing story. So we're deeply grateful and deeply honored that you took the time to join us again after, after a long day. I know that you've had... Uh, uh, are you there in the operating room or is that the examination room? Or this where is are one you? Of our, yeah, this is one of our mm -hmm. clinic rooms. Um, that's just the black screen where we take our before and after photos. And this is the, one of the tables and we have a lot of implants there. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask all of the students uh, online to please say thank you, Doris. Please put it on there. And Doris, I want you to look at chat and watch hundreds of thank yous come before. Come, <laughs> come, come pouring in from a lot of grateful <laughs> students around the world. So that's we're awesome. Just, we're, we're <laughs> Thank just, you. That's awesome, awesome that you guys participated and um, you, you guys made my day today. Like this is really nice to see the uh, support and, and people like joining in. This is like incredible. Well, and you ours, uh, Doris. Well, on behalf of the whole team, everybody, we, we want to thank Doris and her amazing talk that she gave this evening. Uh, we're glad that you came. We're going to be here next week. We will either be having a dermatologist. We're waiting for a confirmation. We thought we had it. Or we will do interviews next week. And we, we're going to send out a notice for volunteers. Uh, Adidia, I believe you put a notice in a little while ago. Uh, virtual shadowing at gmail.com. I believe that's correct. Uh, if you would be interested in being one of the uh, volunteers to be interviewed online in front of, you know, 300 people next week. And so... Uh, Doris, we're very grateful. The whole virtual shadowing team, always just uh, terrific to have uh, this wonderful participation by this really, really smart and energetic group. And so on behalf of Doris and the whole virtual shadowing team, we want to say thank you for coming tonight. And we wish you a good evening.